one side and one family on the other. Aiden, you going with oh, yeah, Pikachu's gonna hang around. Make sure I got everything in order here. Okay. Oh, God is good. Amen. Amen. I, uh, man, you know, that song, Who Brings Our Chaos Back Into Order. God is just, he's faithful. Uh, as we celebrate uh, new life in Christ through baptism and we celebrate new life in our church family uh, through baby dedication. This is an exciting point uh, in the life of a church family. Uh, to see uh, these little ones come forward. You're watching me, aren't you? <laughs> He's locked in more than most people are when I preach. I, I appreciate Oh, <laughs> typical. <laughs> but to see families come forward. Because, uh, you know, one thing I learn every single day that I'm a parent is how imperfect I am at it and how many times I mess up and make mistakes. Uh, but it also reminds me that we serve an incredible, incredible God who's gracious, and who is guiding. Uh, so as we celebrate with these families, I shared with First Service, you know, this is a dedication of these children. But as much as it's that, it's also a dedication of these parents and a dedication of this church body. Uh, so as we come together, I want to just set the tone and remind us that this is a biblical practice, uh, that Jesus himself was dedicated uh, as a child. He was taken into the temple. Uh, but perhaps the most famous uh, story of dedication, aside from Jesus, is found in 1 Samuel. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 24 through 28, it said, Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with three bulls, one ephah, flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young, and they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord. As your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. And so they worshipped the Lord there. So this morning as we have these two children, Mac Hunter Stover, as Emily and Hunter brought them this morning, as we have Amelia J.C. Lumley, that has been brought by Logan and Jeanette and Eden. Uh, we celebrate. We celebrate uh, y'all. Uh, it's a blessing to have parents that want to come and take this point and say that they want to commit themselves to God's guidance and they want to see these children raised to love and serve the Lord. So this morning we're going to make, we're going to have two charges, a charge to these parents. And y'all, it's just like a wedding. Uh, I'm going to give you the charge and you'll respond with, we do. This is just you making this pledge before this church family and before the Lord. And then church family, you'll have a charge as well that I'll read to you in a moment. So to these parents, recognizing the vast responsibility of parenting and your dependence upon Almighty God for strength and wisdom, do you bring these children to be dedicated to the Lord? And do you commit this day to teaching them to love and serve God while praying that one day they might receive Jesus Christ as their Savior? Church family, if you will promise to love and support and pray for these parents while living as faithful witnesses of Jesus Christ and his gospel so that these children can look to the members of this church body as role models of Christian love and service, would you affirm that by saying amen? amen. Let's go to the Lord and pray a prayer of dedication over Amelia and Matt. Father God, we give you thanks for these two young lives. Lord, we know that you have plans for them and plans for their families. Lord, bless these parents as they seek to raise these kids, to, to point them toward you, to show them your love and your grace and your mercy, to teach them about you, and the Lord, just guide them. Give them grace on the tough days. Give them joy in every moment. Lord, I pray that this church family would surround them with love and let them know that we stand with them, that we support them, that we care for them, that we want to show the love of Jesus to them as they love these children. Help us to love these children and to point them toward Christ. Lord, I pray for Mac that you would make him a man of God, 
that you would help him to grow, to love, to serve you, to bring you honor and glory, that he would come to know Jesus Christ and surrender his life to him as his Lord and Savior. For Amelia, Lord, I pray that you would use her in a mighty way, that you would help her to grow. I pray that you would help her to come to know that she has a Savior that loves her, that gave his life for her, and that she too would believe in him and be saved. God, we give you the glory for these babies, for these families, for all that you're doing in our midst. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I'm going to present two things. A certificate of dedication. I'm going to ask you all as parents to sign it. as a, Not up here, but when you get home. As a reminder of the promises you made and that this church has made today uh, to walk with God. I'm also going to present these kids with a copy of God's Word. A reminder that it is the ultimate guide to life, the ultimate guide to parenting. It's the ultimate guide to knowing how we are to live, who our God is, and how much he loves us. So we're going to present both of these to y'all, to Amelia. Oh, not that one. <laughs> and to Mac. He's going to pay kids. We're praying for y'all. We love y'all. And we are here for y'all. And we're going to continue to pray for these kiddos as they come. There are some really great parts to my job. You know it. You know, I'm always amazed when God is at work. The, the ways he can take us as a church body, us as people, with all of our peopleness. You can imply that however you want to. And he can guide us and he can help us to grow and he can help us to love each other and he can bring us together around his gospel around what he's done for us. Knowing that we're not perfect, that we're flawed, but that he is good and he is gracious. You know, this morning, um, we begin to mark this, this Holy Week, as it's traditionally called. Uh, and one of my friends put it this way, and I liked it. He said, the only reason we can call this week holy is because the man that we honor and reflect on this week is holy. It's not the days themselves, but it's the one that we look to. And so as we begin with Palm Sunday, and, and it sets the tone for this entire week, and something we need to remember about this week is that none of the events in Christ's life, none of the events in Scripture, especially none of the events leading up to his death, were coincidental. There was nothing done by accident. There was nothing done randomly. There were no coincidences, but rather... God was meticulously at work in the lead up to the death of Christ. We've looked the last few weeks in the Gospels at stories of his healing and his miracles and his teaching and who Christ is and how he's at work. And now we get to this point where he, has, he is heading into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, knowing what lies before him. And it says he comes down the Mount of Olives, and I know Brother Charlie read the scripture to you from John's gospel. This morning I want to look at a part of this story actually found over in Luke's gospel. Um, and I don't want to reread everything, but essentially the, the story of Palm Sunday, he, he sends his disciples out and he tells them to go find this donkey. And they go and they find it and he says, bring it to me. And if they ask you why you're taking it, say the Lord needs it. And he goes and it miraculously it is just as Jesus said that it was and the donkey is there and they untie it and they bring it to the Lord and they throw their cloaks on the donkey and he begins to ride down the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem and he's descending down and he begins to encounter crowds of people and they would throw their cloaks over the road or as the scriptures record they would go out to the palm trees and cut down the branches and lay those in the road and celebrate as Jesus passed by. Because why? What's he been doing? He's been teaching, preaching, healing. He's been performing miracles. They knew there was something great about this man. And they're celebrating him. Some of them in the crowd may have had different intent or understanding of what he was doing. They might have thought he was riding in to take over Jerusalem. Some of them truly seem to understand. Although we know by the end of the week, the disciples would be scattered. 
And the, the scene shift, and I hope you follow it this week, find a Bible reading plan uh, that guides you through what happens each day of this week, as best scholars can tell. And how we go through the week and he arrives to this celebration on Sunday. And then throughout the week he begins, he goes and he cleanses the temple. And he begins to teach and he begins to do other things while he's in the city. In fact, if you look at the Gospels, a massive percentage of those four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, take place after Jesus arrives in Jerusalem before his crucifixion in this one week. And all the things that go on, and you've got the things Jesus is doing. You have the behind the scenes where Judas is setting up for his betrayal of Jesus, eventually moving through to Thursday night when he gathered his disciples in that upper room and celebrated the Passover and gave us this memorial meal by which we remember his sacrifice on the cross, going to Friday where he dies on the cross for our sins. In the meantime, he'd been arrested, he'd been betrayed, the disciples had been scattered. The scene from Sunday drastically shifts by Thursday night. Yet, it's Sunday. The people are celebrating. Luke says that he rode into the city and he was drawing near, verse 37 of Luke 19, now drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice, praising God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. You have the Pharisees, the religious leaders, look at Jesus. They see the celebration. They see people praising him. And they say, Jesus, you should silence them. You know, Fletcher made a theological point this week. We were talking about this very week and what it means and what happened on Palm Sunday. And uh, Fletcher's getting into to rhyming words and figuring that kind of stuff out. And he just, we talked about it. And it was about 15 seconds went by. And he looks up and he goes, Ferris wheels are fun. Pharisees are not. Okay, so there's what you can take away this week. Uh, if any of you got your sermon notes, uh, Ferris wheels are fun, Pharisees are not. It's true. The Pharisees show up and they say, Jesus, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus says, if I tell them to be quiet, the rocks will cry out in praise. What he's saying is, I, I can't silence creation from praising its creator. We know Jesus was there. We just sang it in the song. You were the word at the beginning, one with God most high. Jesus was there, your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. He was there in the beginning. He was there from the dawn of time. He was at work in creation. And now he's here on the earth, the king of glory. Imagine that. The one who created the donkey on which he sat rode in on the donkey. In humility, yet being celebrated by some as king. Had he told them to quit crying out, it says the very rocks, the very earth would cry out. So we have a scene of celebration. A scene where the disciples are excited. A scene where everything seems to be going really well at this point in the story. But I want us to see the heart of Jesus. This is often the part that we don't pick up when we get into our Palm Sunday reading. He's still riding the donkey in verse 41. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus here weeps. In the middle of all the celebration, he weeps. In the middle of all the, the ringing out of Hosanna, and the ringing out of blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the shouts of glory to the king, the high and holy one. Glory to him. All the praise. He weeps. Because he comes over the Mount of Olives and he sees Jerusalem laid out before him. 
He would have seen the temple. He would have seen the massive crowds gathering in for the Passover celebration that had come from all over the place. As my grandmama would have said, every which way. They'd all gathered in and they were there to celebrate and to worship. Yet Jesus weeps. Because though Jesus was the king, though Jesus was the one for whom the rocks would cry out, glory, 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 he knew that that city was full of people who had been promised a Messiah, who were waiting on their king to show up, and who would reject him. Who would take him to a cross and shout crucify. He didn't weep because he was going to enter Jerusalem and face physical pain, though he would. He didn't weep because he was going to enter Jerusalem and his disciples were going to get scared and scattered, though they would. He didn't weep because he was going to enter Jerusalem and one of his twelve was going to betray him, though he would. He wept because he knew there were people who were rejecting the one God had sent. In fact, Jesus' prophecy would come true just about 35 years after he died and rose again when Jerusalem would be overrun by the Romans and would be burnt to the ground with the temple being fully destroyed. Folks, Jesus knew what he was talking about. And his heart broke because the people of Jerusalem did not see their king while he was with them. He said, you did not know the time of your visitation. He's saying, I'm right here. I'm right here with you, and yet you will reject me. The triumphal entry that he had embarked on that would lead to his crucifixion, that while the, ch the chants and the shouts of truth were rising up, the murmurings in the city against him were growing, and he wept. The question sits before all of us today. We all, so long as we have breath in our lungs, and particularly now sitting here hearing the gospel, hearing that this Savior did come, the one who created all things, the King of glory, the one who has existed from the beginning, the Son of God comes down to earth sinlessly, perfect, and lives a life sinlessly. And looking at us in our brokenness, in our sins, in the ways we, each and every one of us, fall short day by day. And he goes to the cross. And he dies. And the Bible tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but desires all to come to a knowledge of the truth. That he invites all of us to come and to know him. And today is the day we know that Jesus moved with compassion. He wept. It didn't say a tear filled his eye. It didn't say he had that single tear roll down his cheek like you see in the movies, right? It said he wept. Imagine the scene, the glory of Palm Sunday and the broken-hearted Savior, the king who was heartbroken for the people he had come to redeem who would reject him. Yet that king willingly goes to the cross for you and that king today calls you to come and to know him and to be saved. And today you face the same choice that if you don't know Jesus Christ, that he invites you in this moment in this time, to come and to know him. To know that you're a sinner and to know that he came to save you and to place your faith and trust in him as your Lord and Savior. Or you can be like those in Jerusalem and walk right past it. For the believer today that knows this truth, this is the time for us to shout Hosanna and to worship him. Not because we're better than anybody else, but because we know the beauty of our Savior. And in hopes that our shouts of Hosanna and of exalting Him and glorifying Him in our lives can be a witness to those who have yet to come to know Him. And that as we participate in this Lord's Supper, we're reminded that His body was broken for us and His blood was shed for us on that cross. We understand that we have nothing special in us. We are the recipients of the beautiful grace of God. So we say, Hosanna. We say, glory to the king who's come for us. This morning, as we prepare for this time, I invite you, if you've never known him, 
you've never known him as your Savior, today is the day. If he's calling you, respond. And know that he's inviting you, that he came for you, that he loves you. And don't leave questioning. But come to know the one who gave his all for you. Father God, in this moment, this morning, I pray that if there's someone in this church that has never known Jesus Christ as their Savior, has never had that moment of acknowledging and confessing their sins before you, and calling on you who alone can forgive, and who made our salvation possible by sending Jesus to die, that today would be the day that they would come and surrender their life to him and know the hope, the joy, and the everlasting life that's found only in Jesus. And that, Lord, for believers around this room today, as we prepare to remember that sacrifice that purchased our salvation, that, Lord, we would open our hearts to you. That, Lord, we...